Okay, oh, so that's, uh, this is the um, end of uh, the Metabolism Day. So that's, uh, the, this is our last speaker, but you know, thanks for sticking around. You don't regret you know, staying here. So that's, uh, Mori is one of the most inspirational and then also insightful you know, scientists like I met you know, during my career. Basically also, I met Mori you know, like 20 years ago when I was a PhD student at Justin David Center. I met him, one of PhD students speaker, you know, lunch. So that's, uh, he was generous enough to provide his no cut models and you know, experimental design and reagent for me to develop my career. And then after that, I developed my career downstream of Mori. And then that it was been successful. So I'm sure after his talk, you get insight, you know, in inspiration from him. So just to quickly, you know, everybody knows Mori, but he had a distinct you know, academic career. He had appointment at Harvard Medical School, associate professor of cell biology. And then he was professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and the investigator of Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute. And uh, so that's uh, he, you know, at early stages, so that's uh, he had a very competitive project of cloning insulin sensitive glucose transporter GRID4. And then he had a single OSA paper in cell, which is quite unusual. And then there is a lot of debate who was the first, who was the light sequence at Google's transporter meeting, but I'm sure Mori is the light one. <laughs> so that's afterwards, actually, that's he really concentrated on the insulin action in terms of signaling process, focusing on AKT regulation, M2 compress regulation, and looking into adipose, hepatocytes, metabolic flux regulation at cellular and whole body level. And he made seminal discovery at various aspects. So, after 30 years of very successful academic career, it was surprising for us. Mori decided to take the new challenge in 2014, took a scientific chief officer position at Pfizer, uh, the, uh, the section of the internal medicine research unit. So that's, uh, it was very surprising, but you know, I thought that this is his you know, kind of a last agenda to, as a physician scientist, to translate in basic research into tangible and then credible into you know clinic, clinical elements, so that's we are pleased to see that. And then you know Mori read you know Nobel Transformative uh, Drug Discovery Program, guiding you know basic scientist technology development, and from you know the bench to clinical side of the proof of concept study. So that's uh, you know and then actually again coming back, that's uh, you know he's a really insightful uh, scholar, and then he's going to tell us today Nobel Therapeutics for Metabolic Diseases, and then. Stage is yours, Mori. Thank you very much for coming. Thank, thank you, Kay. I, I guess it's time for questions. Is that uh, are we up to there? Uh, thank you. That's a very, very flattering, and uh, you know, in, in um, an introduction like that makes me question whether uh, you know. I've always thought you've had great scientific judgment. Now I'm beginning to wonder. But thank you for the uh, introduction, uh, and uh, and thank thank you, Jolene, for the in, in, uh, invitation. I'll add my thanks to all of you for staying, um, uh, staying this late. Uh, I, I'll, I'll do my best to make it worth your while. And thank you everybody here for uh, putting together a great meeting. It's really been, it's, it's been wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll also apologize for the relatively nonspecific title, which is the usual, the usual stall when you don't know what you're going to talk about when you agree to do this a long time in advance. But let me tell you what I will talk about today. So what I do want to tell you about today is a... Um, what, what I think is a new strategy for identifying um, uh, targets uh, to treat, potentially treat obesity, okay? And I'll, I'll tell you about, but before I, I do that, I wanna tell you just a few words about a, a, a much more mature program we have at Pfizer, which is developing a small molecule agonist for the GLP-1 receptor, because that's, it's at a stage where it's very exciting, we're getting data, we have some clinical data, which, you know, always, it's so long to, between getting a molecule or mechanism in clinical data that I want to share that with you. Now, I have to say, when I started thinking about actually doing that, um, I really began thinking it was crazy to be talking about GLP-1 receptor agonists, the Nova Foundation. And the obvious, the, uh, the obvious um, uh, phrase that occurred to me was uh, bringing coals to Newcastle. I think, I don't know if everybody's familiar with that, but it's the idea of... Um, of uh, replicating something or bringing something to people who know a lot more about it than you do in talking about it. So um, that's, uh, that actually dates back to a, a 17th century article. Now, the other thing I will, when, when I started looking about researching bringing um, 
uh, Colts to Newcastle, I encountered this guy over here, Timothy, there we are, Timothy Dexter. And I'm not going to talk about him. So he actually, he had some colleagues who wanted to make fun of him, ridicule him. And what they did was they convinced him to bring coal to Newcastle. Newcastle in the UK, of course, is, the, is, is where all coal comes from. So they convinced him to do it to ridicule him. So he did that. He got together all this Virginia soft coal, brought it to Newcastle. When he got there, it turned out there was a mining strike going on, and he made enormous amounts of money for it. And his entire life was like this. So if you really want to see an illustration of why it's better to be lucky than smart, th th this is the guy you should look up. because he's the, And in many ways, that yeah, I think a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of drug discovery has taught us that same lesson. So let, let me um, go. So, so I, I think I'm not going to talk much about the, the mechanism of GLP-1 receptor agonists or the development of the injectable forms. I'm sure everybody here knows about that well. But let me just start by emphasizing that this is a very good drug, and it's, 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 it's making a lot of, if nothing else, it's making a lot of money for some companies, Novo Nordisk, Lilly, several others. This is simply is a relatively recent slide, you can see that from 2022, showing um, the, the amount of income coming in from, uh, from the total GLP-1 receptor agonists, all of them together, and then breaking them down into the individual ones. And I won't go through it, but on the left you can see you know, the, the list of them, including the most recent, which is the um, oral orally available semaglutide, which is brought to you by Novo. And you can see, this is, this is quarterly drug sales. You see, we're talking about $4.5 billion. So th if you look at this, you say, wow, this is a really effective drug, not only treating the disease, but getting out there in the community and being, um, and being utilized. $400 billion quarterly, so now you're talking to almost a $20 billion market. That's a lot, even for a diabetes drug. But it's, it's a little bit deceptive, because if you look at it another way, and don't look at it in terms of the market size, in terms of money, and instead look at it as prescriptions written, what percentage of prescriptions are being written for, for, the, for the GLP-1 receptor agonist as a class, it's very low. It's remarkably low, given how long they've gone around. This particular analysis shows you it's close to, it's, it's under 4% of prescriptions written for diabetes. Now, th this was a couple of years ago, um, but it's still pretty true today, and I just, you know, I'll show you, uh, you know, a more recent study that came out. This is just from a couple of months ago, and it basically asks the question, for those patients with diabetes and either cardiovascular disease or high cardiovascular risk, what percentage of those papers, patients are getting a prescription for GLP-1 receptor agonist? Now, there is absolutely no doubt in anybody's mind that that patient group should be on these drugs. It reduces cardiovascular risk. Um, uh, at least in a population, and you can see it's you can see the percentage. It's vanishingly small. So, in spite of the fact that you know our, our, our colleagues at Lilly and Novo have developed this spectacular drug, which not only lowers blood sugar, not only reduces your body weight, but it actually reduces your your um, uh, cardiovascular risk and reduces your liver fat and many other things, it's not being used. So there are a lot of reasons why not, and I don't certainly don't want to oversimplify it, but. A lot of people who have gone out and asked this question have found that to a certain extent it's because of hesitation to take an injectable form of drug. And, and, and there's several reasons for that. To some extent, what, what we found when we started asking physicians that, we found out that a lot of practicing generalists, particularly in the United States, just don't have the time to teach people to inject. So they, they, they don't do it. They refer their type 1 diabetics to an endocrinologist and they just won't do it. A lot of patients, particularly with obesity, we, you know, where the social, social aspects are very complex, don't perceive themselves as having a disease. So um, we thought that it was very important to bring to this population an alternative to injection. Now, I'm, you know, I just want to emphasize that you know, I'm, I'm not talking about competing with injectables. You know, there's 100 million people in the United States who are obese and could use this. So what we're really thinking about doing is bringing another form of the drug to really provide access to people who just for one reason or another are not taking injectables. So above, you can see the history of uh, the search for GLP-1 receptor antagonist at Pfizer. It started in 2004. I mean, that's, that's a long time to be working on a single drug target. I just want to make it clear that I showed up in, in, in 2014, so I was not responsible for all of this success, or for the ultimate success. And I have to say, right now, we have, as far as we know, the lead molecule, and it wasn't 
um, you know, it wasn't because everybody didn't try to make this. And, I, you know, and I, I, won't, I won't go through the, the details. It, it just turns out that when, when you're looking at receptors that bind peptides, the peptide binding site actually turns out to be very long and inserts into the membrane. I think uh, Randy alluded to this earlier. So it's really hard to make a, sm you know, a small molecule that's really going to replicate the effects of it. But Pfizer did, and this goes through the history, and it's, it's kind of cool because it does show you all the things that the scientists, the medicinal chemistry tried, you know, a, a classic high-throughput screen, then a larger high-throughput screen, and then looking for a positive allosteric modulator, and, um, and, and th then some other things. There was... Uh, you know, receptor over overexpression, so it sensed us. Well, they did that, and they got a lot of nonspecific, a lot of false positives because the receptor overexpression. Mutagenesis, well, where do you mutate it to make it more sensitive, and then how do you know it's going to work on wild type? So where it finally, where it finally worked, um, which, as I said, started in 2013, I take no credit for it, was actually using a poly, poly um, uh, an allosteric poly, uh, a allosteric modifier, positive allosteric modifier, developed actually at UT Southwestern. For those who don't know, these are drugs which really are, don't activate receptors on their own, but when you have them, an activator uh, will have a greater effect. And you can you can actually see that over here. So, um, you know, it, it's called various things, compound B, but you can see this is an insulin secretion assay. You know, on its own, compound B has, has a trivial effect. This is GLP, actually the real GLP peptide, but together there's a, a fairly significant effect. And, um, and this shows, it actually turns out to be a covalent modifier of an internal cysteine. So what the Pfizer medicinal chemists did was they repeated the screen in the presence of this PAM. And what they did is they got one hit. By the way, we've done these number of times, we still have only one chemical series that worked. But what they found was they found a, a, a molecule that stimulated the activity of, of, the, of, the, of the receptor in the presence of the, uh, in the, uh, the allosteric modifier, the positive allosteric modifier. It, on its own, it, didn't, it never would have been picked up. But it's the nature of, of medicinal chemistry now that once you identify a small molecule that binds, and then at, while this was going on, the structure came out, but much later, then you can do the structure actual related, you know, relationship and get it up. So the key thing for the Pfizer um, uh, medicinal chemists was running the screen in the presence of uh, a PAM, getting a hit, and then taking away the PAM, and eventually reaching a point where, through classic medicinal chemistry, that it really works on its own. Um, and uh, my, my only contribution to this, I, I will say, is even though I didn't come till it was working for 2014, I at least was part of the team that really believed we should stay with this and keep at it because, one, having confidence that um, the chemists at Pfizer are very good and could eventually get there, but also having confidence that, um, that this would be good for patients. So I'm not going to show you all the biochemistry. It turns out that this is a small molecule, high affinity, not as high as GLP-1, which has really low nanomolar, but it's pretty high. And I will just tell you that in a lot of biochemical assays I'm going to show you, we have never been able to distinguish a difference between the authentic peptide and, and a small molecule, which is called, it actually has a name, it's called danucliperon now. Danucliperon, and we've never been able to... This is, turns out, like a lot of these molecules, to be human-specific. You know, the GLP-1 isn't, but that's, that's not right. So I'm just going to jump to the question, what happens when you put this into people? And what I'm showing you is a four-week study um, and uh, where we're looking at a number of things, but you can see plasma glucose, mean daily glucose, hemoglobin A1C, and weight. The, the one thing I should caution you about is, again, I think probably most of you know that the biggest problem with this drug is GI intolerability, and the way you get around it is by titrating up. And um, I could talk about it later, I won't go into it now. In this study, you know, we basically had a choice. We could either do a good titration and get up to a whole d a high dose, or we could titrate really quickly, not be able to assess intolerability, but get an idea whether the, whether the thing worked or not. And obviously, we elected the latter. So this particular study involved two weeks of titration and then two weeks of, 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 um, of um, treatment to the maximal dose. And you can see that fasting plasma glucose you know, at, at the higher dose was decreasing 90 milligrams per deciliter. You, you, you know where diabe a typical diabetic with an a, a hemoglobin A1C around 7 is. That's, that's correcting the fasting blood glucose. Uh, mean plasma glucose, look at hemoglobin A1C. Even under this, this very short time period, it's decreasing in 1.2. And perhaps most impressively, 
um, we, had, we saw a tremendous amount of weight loss even in this short period. Now, of course, these were patients who were having a lot of GI upset, so it's a little bit hard to, you know, to, to really know exactly why they were losing weight till we get into a longer study. So we're very excited about this molecule. It's currently in, in, in phase. It's currently in phase two B, um, and, and we're developing it. We're really optimistic. I, as I said, right now, it's indistinguishable between the ones that are on the market. But I caution you that there, are, in general, it's very difficult to compare different studies without running things side by side. And in particular, with this particular class of molecules. Um, you really don't know how they work till you do real world, to get real world experience, because you really can push the tolerability on an inpatient study. So, in, yeah, inpatient. So, anyway, very excited about it, and um, uh, I, I'm happy to report it to you. But so, so why why did I say that I'm going to talk about strategies for developing um, uh, novel targets for obesity? If I if I've emphasized, as I'm sure all of you heard, that this is a great obesity drug. Let me show you a little bit of where it falls short. So on the left, you can see the, um, the, you know, the efficacy of this, the, the, num the percentage of patients responding to, uh, to GLP-1 with different levels of, um, of weight loss. And you can see when you get up, when you start asking for 15% weight loss or so, half, half of the patients respond. So that's a lot of individuals out there who still are not going to have adequate body weight. Now, most people, you know, when you think about diabetes, people think about 10, 10 kilograms or so because the best data would say that'll have a profound effect on, on, on metabolic. But for, for obesity, you want to get higher. So that's one thing. First of all, it doesn't work in everybody. And it doesn't, even in people it works in, it doesn't always get to the level of weight loss you'd like. This other one to me is very, very interesting. Again, this is a study that just came out a couple of months ago and really asked the question, um, what percentage of people who, who get the drug for weight loss still take it a year later and two years later? And what this shows you, uh, if you look at the far right over here, um, it shows you that two years after people are prescribed GLP-1, this is all of them together, not 67, two-thirds of them are no longer taking the drug. And what's, to me, what was most counterintuitive about this study is the compliance is significantly less for the weekly drugs, not the daily. Now, I think certainly I and most of us thought that as, as administration would become more intermittent, it would be a lot easier to comply. It's exactly the opposite, and you can see that there. So efficacy, um, uh, you know, uh, ease of taking. So for all of those reasons, I, I, you know, I believe, and I think everybody else believes, that there's still a lot of opportunity for other drugs. Okay, so let me, I think I went too far. Okay. So, as you all know, one of the, one of the hardest things about drug discovery in general is, is translating animal models to humans, and they don't translate. In the case of obesity, it's even worse because... There are many reasons why a mouse will stop eating, other than loss of appetite, other than physiologically relevant increasing energy metabolism, and you don't know which of those, even they're, they're, you know, you can do aversion tests and that sort of thing, but really you just don't know until you get it in person. Again, Ramona Bant is a great example of that, where it was a wonderful drug and got in people, they got incredibly depressed and it's not a good drug. So that's the sort of stuff. So, what I'm going to tell you about is something we've begun doing, which really starts with the human genetics and looks for targets, and then works back to mice afterwards. And it really takes advantage of something I, somebody earlier referred to, I believe, and that's the UK Biobanks. The UK Biobank is, a, um, uh, is, is, a, is something that's going on in the UK where patients are getting exonics, they're getting their exome sequenced, and the, the data available in their medical record is available is publicly. By the way, this work, the way this works is Pfizer and many other companies fund this, and what we get in exchange for it is access to the data for a year. So it's just a wonderful example of a private-public relationship where Pfizer gets first look, but all of the data after a year becomes available to everybody, even though Pfizer and other drug companies are footing a lot of the cost. So that's it. So, that's, that, so, that, so that is the idea. Let's look at a sequenced population of individuals and see whether we can use that to find targets. Well, a couple of obvious problems. Um, the first one is shown on this slide, and that is, you know, once we now have experience sequencing large populations, what we found is, and this is, this is high blood pressure, but it's true for every sequencing uh, study that's been done as far as I know of, what you find is those mutations with the largest effect size 
are the rarest. And it's why you have to sequence, in the case of the UK Biobank, we're now up to 500,000. You don't see these very often. So, and when you're talking about stuff like diabetes, obesity, you know, it's, it's such a complex, you, there are so many genetic and, um, and environmental factors that influence it. You just can't interpret a single individual or two or three individuals. So you have this problem of the common alleles where you can look at a lot of patients don't do very much, so they're hard to study. The rare alleles, which you really want to use, are very are are the rare alleles that have are the ones that have the big effects size. That's one problem. The other problem with these kind of studies, also, you know, is it just makes sense, and and that is if you begin looking at coding mutations. Remember, these are exon sequencing. We're not finding those kind of mutations that Karen, you know, discussed this morning, ex expression. The reality is, even with the best in silico programs, it is very hard to predict the biochemical consequences of a given coding mutation. So again, this is shown on the left as just something I pulled from the literature. It's, it's, it, it's a, a, a fairly famous receptor for obesity or appetite control. It's the MC4R receptor. And in this particular study, what the, what the, what the, what the scientists did was they just mutated one intracellular loop and ask what's the consequences. And they just did usual scanning type of mutagenesis. And as you can see on the left, um, depending upon the, the, the um, residue, there was differences in cell surface. And as you can see on the right, the, the, the variation in activity, biochemical activity, was enormous. There were some mutants that were activating, there were some that were inhibitory. Most did nothing. So if you take that data and you look for an association with a phenotype Almost invariably, you're not going to find any because you're looking at a collection of different, different biochemical consequences, and, and you're going to lose the ones. So, okay, so, that's, so those are the two problems. The, the mutations that have the biggest effect size are really hard to find, and two, you, you know, if you just look at a large collection of mutants, you can't relate it to the phenotype. So here's the, here's the way we, we're trying to get around it. And that is basically by triangulating two, three measurements. One is the mutation itself, so, we, so the, these are the UK Biobank se sequence, so we know where the mutation is. Um, the second is the phenotype of the individual, and that comes out of the, the UK Biobank also. So what we get from the UK Biobank, we get the mutation, we get the phenotype. Uh, and, um, and here's the third thing, which is a little bit different, and that's the, essentially the biochemical activity. And that's what makes the difference, and I'll show you why that works in a second. So we are collaborating with a company called Domain Therapeutics. It came out of a lab in, um, in, in McGill. And, oh, and what they've done is set up a reasonably high-throughput assay for looking at uh, of activities of uh, GPCRs. And it, you know, it's, it's a bioluminous transfer assay, very common. You know, you're looking for association. Basically, what they're looking at is association of a G protein with a GPCR. What they've done is they have a number of cell lines where they've put, put fluorescent tags or bioluminescent tags on the GPCRs. You put on, you know, you, you want to measure activity, you put on the ligand, and you can not only know the consequences of that mutation, you know the consequences of that mutation on the many different pathways. So. Um, it, it really, it works. I'll come back in a little while and talk about its shortcomings, but let me just show you when it, when it really works. So again, we, we're going we're to take three different pieces of data, where the mutation is, what the phenotype of that individual is, and the biochemical consequences of the mutation. And I'll show you one where we, we know a lot about the receptor. This is the beta-1 beta adrenergic receptor, right? Now, if you look, so on the right is, 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 is the colorized description of the activity of these different mutations. And on the left is the location of the mutations. And all, the first thing to look at is that the color distribution means that mutations with various biochemical effects are distributed throughout the receptor. And other than perhaps a cluster of loss of functions and what we know to be the, the ligand binding unit in the, the third transmembrane domain, you'd never know. And, you, and the way we've presented it here is, is on the left, you can see where the mutations are. And on the right is the consequence of those mutations um, lined up from, uh, from the effect. So on the, on the one on the tops are loss of function mutations. Most of the ones in green have no consequence on activity. And then there's always a handful, and this is always the smaller group, the gain of function, the constitutively active. So now we, we, we can link those two together. So here's the critical graph. So what you're looking at here is on the, on, on the x-axis across here, what you're looking at is the activity of the receptor 
that mutant, specific mutant, based on the domain assay I described earlier. And on the left is a massaged indication of the phenotype, okay? Each, our, each circle tells you a different mutation. And in this particular, the particular demonstration, the intensity of the red color tells you the number of independent individuals with that specific mutation. Each circle is a mutation at a specific residue. The, and, 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 and as you can see, as I, I, I said earlier, you look at the ones at the extent with the biggest size, whether it's loss of function or gain of function, you can see that they're the lightest, they have the fewest patients. And in some cases, we're talking about one or two individuals. I shouldn't say patients, these are normal individuals where you're measuring body weight. So that's the graph. You're, as you would expect, you could graph for each mutation, you can graph biochemical activity against consequences. So what do you get out of that? Well, okay, the first thing you get out of it is, you know, you, you, you have wild type. You can, you can divide everything into four quadrants. There's, there, you know, there's what we call wild type weight, if there is such a thing. Here's wild type activity, but you can see that everything above, um, you know, of, above the wild type activity has, you know, has, in this case, we're looking at blood pressure. I'm sorry, I should have said this. This is the beta-adrenergic receptor. We know that's related to blood pressure. So ones that biochemically have, um, you know, are, are, are thought to have uh, that where we find their increased activity on the right, it's not working. And on the left, you can see the lower the biochemical activity, as you would expect, the lower the change in blood pressure. Now, there are a lot of there are a lot of dots that are way off the curve because a lot of other things. And, and you know, and in the middle, the ones that have very little consequence where you see the biggest circles, not there, the biggest big red spot in the middle, most mutations, doesn't change activity a lot. Okay, so so this is a curve you can have you you can do if you have a phenotype and you have a receptor that's sequenced. And um, what can you? Yeah, so I'm sorry. Let me just tell you. So what else can you learn from this? What you can do is if you look at the actual y-intercept, it will tell you the maximal effect of a loss of function mutation by extravagance. It'll show you the maximal effect of a heterozygote because everybody we're looking at here. So you can actually get this plot and you can ask the question, if we have, if we have a drug that inhibits at 50%, what would be the predicted effect size? And by, if you, if you look at the interaction between the two alleles by looking at large populations, you can actually predict. Let me give you an example with something which is, which is, um, uh, Okay, and, and this is the one, this again, this is the beta receptor, and you can see exactly what I, what I was telling you about. You can see on the left, the intercept tells you that you would predict that a heterozygous uh, patient, complete loss of function in one allele, would, would decrease blood pressure 3.4 milligrams per millimeters mercury, and you can predict that a homozygous, you don't have any homozygous here, but you can predict by knowing how these alleles interact that a complete loss of function, or one would predict a complete inhibitor would reduce blood pressure that much. And again, the same thing with activators. Okay, um, and it's actually not bad. I mean, we, since we have Indorol, we can actually go back and ask the question, do these predictions actually come out? And without showing the clinical data, they're really not bad. Now, before I go any further, I have to acknowledge the people who really developed this. And um, the two, the, there were a lot of, a lot of Pfizer colleagues who were involved, but the two most important are in bold, um, J.P. Fortan is an expert in, glu in GPCRs. He runs our biochemical pharmacology group. And in collaboration with Eric Fauman, who runs our computational genetics group, they came up with this particular strategy. Okay, well, what about a receptor that we really care about in regard to, uh, and, and we care about obesity? Let's look at the MC4 receptor. Now, we know loss of function MC4 mutations are associated with, with severe obesity, um, less common are gain of functions which are protection. And th this is exactly what this, this, sli this um, slide shows you. This is the same kind of analysis I showed you earlier. Again, across the x-axis, you can see on the far left of the loss of function, exper lo loss of function um, mutants, on the far right of the few rare gain of function mutants there are. In the middle over the green are the majority of mutations which have no biochemical effect. And as you can see, if you had this data before you knew about MC4R, you would predict that a loss of function is associated with an increase in body weight. And again, as shown up here, you actually can predict what the body weight would be. And you know, seven, seven kilograms for a heterozygous individual is a very large, um, uh, a very large uh, effect size of a heterozygous mutation. Okay. And 
you know, it isn't perfect for a lot of reasons, but it, it's pretty good for at least comparing effect size, uh, you know, uh, among different targets, which is better, which is the other. Okay, well, can we actually use this for something useful or real to solve, aside from finding drug targets, can we actually use it for a, um, solving a real biological question? That's where I want to just, just finish with you. Um, and it's, it's, it's the, it's the glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide receptor, which you've heard about already. Um, Lilly just had approved a peptide which activates both the GIP1 receptor as well as the GLP1 receptor and has published some very impressive data indicating that if you activate both receptors together, you get an increase in, um, in, 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 uh, in efficacy on, on diabetes and perhaps even a more of an, an increase in efficacy on... Um, uh, on weight loss. Here's some of the data in the next slide. So on the left is, is the Lilly data looking at increasing doses of gentrizepatide. This is the peptide which activates both the GIP receptor as well as the GLP-1 receptor and at least as best as possible it's compared with another um, agonist, semaglutide, which just activates one, the GLP-1 receptor. Um, so the argument here is that what you want to do is you active, want to activate them both. But on the right is an experiment done by Amgen and what they've done is made an inhibitor to the GIP-1 receptor and shown that if you administer an antibody which blocks GIP-1, it is additive with GLP-1. So we've got data out there in the literature in humans, actually that's non-human primates, saying that what you want to do to increase efficacy is activate a receptor. What you got in Amgen saying what you want to do is inhibit it. And I will tell you the mouse knockout data does absolutely nothing to resolve it. So the last slide I'll show you is what happens when we apply this, um, this technique and ask the question, in humans, is, is, changes in GI, is changes in body weight associated with an increase in activity of GIP-1 or a loss of activity? And as you can see, um, very, uh, let's see, I've got to do the next one, okay. I'm, as you can see, um, as, you, as you move to the left and have loss of activity mutants, body mass index and body weight decrease. Okay. As you move to the right and get gain of function, they increase. So this shows, to our mind, that at least in the genetic model, um, protection from increased body weight is caused by a loss of function of the GYP1 receptor. Now, I have a couple of slides explaining that to you. I won't take the time to do it because I've run over. But suffice it to say that data from both our group as well as Amgen would indicate that the terzepatide protein is such a strong activator of the GLP-1 GIP-1 receptor that chronic treatment is actually down-regulating it and you're getting a net inhibition of GIP-1 signaling. So if you wanted to make a better version, if it is possible to make a better version, you really might want to think about an inhibitor. Okay, so let me summarize what I've told you about this. We, we call this human genetic structure active relationship. Let me just summarize what this technique is good for. What are the positives? It's in humans. Very good. It, it, you, you can use it to establish the, the, the strength of it as well as directionality. For you know, people who do GWASs, that's one of the things that kills you. What direction is it? Um, you, can, you can figure out the approximate uh, maximal effect. You determine relevant downstream signaling. But what are the negatives? It requires a very large sequenced cohort. There aren't a lot of that running around. You need a continuous variable. To graph that, remember, you need a variable where you just can't, it isn't binary. You can't plot has the disease or doesn't. It's hard to find those. Obesity or body weight is one of the few. Blood pressure is another one. Um, you, you need a medium throughput biochemical assay. Again, there really aren't that many around. And lastly, you need to know the ligand. Remember, the critical thing in the assay is you activate the receptor and ask the consequences. You have a receptor and you don't know how to activate it, which is true of most GPCRs, you can't do it. So let me just again finish up. A lot of people were involved. I really emphasized that in terms of the... Um, in terms of the uh, HGC SAR, that was, that was Eric Foman and uh, JP Fortan. I'll just leave these up there, except to just point out that Jeff Pfeffercoin has always been my associate there, who I do everything with. And I will, since, um, since she was mentioned earlier, I'll point out uh, Kendra Benz, who leads our obesity and liver disease group. So happy to take questions <laughs> if there's time. Sorry for yeah. that. Okay, thank you very much, Molly. Beautiful talk and insightful talk as well. So, um, any questions? And uh, okay. 
Hi, uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, does your analysis that you show us at the end there, does it force a straight line through the data? Because if we we're thinking that the antagonist and the agonist are both pre protective, we'd want to see a, a curved line, right? It, it does force a straight line, and it's you know it's it's clearly one of the you know it's clearly why it's semi quantitative. Um, so it, the weakness is so it's still forcing the straight line still preserves the strength of understanding directionality and consequence. Where it falls short, of course, is 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 quantitative. Is, is it screws up the magnitude. Now, you know, as you know, you, you, through statistical genetics, you can always calculate out what the interaction between the two alleles is, and that would, in principle, allow you to, to get the kind of curve line that would be more accurate. But we just, you know, even, even 400,000 sequences is not enough to get that kind of level of, um, le level of specificity. Do it. Maury, that, uh, that was quite fantastic uh, talk as such. Wish you had two hours instead. That would have been really good. Uh, first one, a comment on the non-peptide uh, GLP-1 agonist. In fact, the first project of that was started in 1990 at Novo Nordisk <laughs> when I was employed out there and told them that this was a great target. And that was actually trying to make a small molecule uh, uh, agonist for the receptor, which then, of course, uh, it took 32 years to then make, and so I'm happy that I left the company very shortly <laughs> before, after, after that. <laughs> Nevertheless, the, and Sue George, who's probably here, was, was actually the project manager out of Novo on that project. Uh, could you say a little more about the true separate type? Because it was, of course, a, a totally uh, a, a enigma in the beginning that why the GIP, GIP agonists would do that much as they claimed in the very early days. And, and now, now it's a, a drug coming out and it's extremely efficacy. But you say that it's actually acting as a functional agonist, or antagonist. So, so we, that's so what we... Are there real yeah. data for that? I mean, that would be fantastic. So, so, since you asked, I will show you. Here are the two pieces of data. So on the left is a downregulation experiment where, the, you know, this is our experiment, which did at Pfizer, Joanne Buxton did it, where we pre-incubated with various concentrations of terpazide, terzepatide overnight, essentially, then came in with a new. And as you can see, the, the, the more you incubate with um, uh, overnight, the more you actually drive down the dose response curve and giving a second dose. That's the way we did it. Um, at, at Amgen, they did it with GIP, not with terzepatide. And again, it's the same sort of thing. A prolonged in a, uh, incubation with GIP obviates the acute response. But what they did is a very nice control where they gave, you know, th they gave another way of activating cyclic AMP and showed it was still there. So it really was at the level of the receptor. So that's what we now... I, 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 by, Lily doesn't believe that. Now, you can, one way of resolving the controversy is simply saying it doesn't matter. Look, the drug works, whether it's chronic downregulation or acute activation, who really cares? It's only if you want to make another molecule in a more designed way, it really helps. Um, GIP is very, very weak, as you saw from the flatness of the curve. It has very little effect on its own. So the argument is it must be either additive or in some way enhance the GLP-1 by a mechanism we don't know, or it reduces the side effects, and some people have argued that really what CHIP is doing is recruiting the adverse um, GI tolerability so you can just get up to a higher dose. Um, there, and the team. Yeah, thanks. Um, as far as I know, there hasn't been any uh, good uh, genetic associations between uh, GLP-1 variants and obesity. So, uh, and that's despite GLP-1 being the best obesity drug out there. So uh, have you tried running GLP-1 in your analysis, and how does that look? It's a good question. I should know the answer to that. Um, we must have done it. I think we picked it up with this analysis. I'll get back to you. If you, you come down afterwards, I'll make sure you get it. Because if, if I remember correctly, we actually did see an association when we did this analysis as opposed to just lining up a bunch of mutations. But let me get back to you on that. Maury, that was really, really great. Um, would this approach ever be used to help stratify uh, people with diabetes or people with obesity into the most optimal care based it, on their personal genetics or in, their genotypes? So in other words, instead of using this to ask, you know, w w the biochemical activity, well, I, I, in principle, yes. But again, the numbers are just extraordinary. You know, this really didn't start working until we started getting data in the hundreds of thousands. And the, the problem, so for maybe diet, I mean, the great thing about body weight is it's a normal function. I mean, one of the 
bad things about the, um, the, um, the UK biobank is it's very biased towards normal individuals. So if you really want to look at disease, it's not, a, it's not a good group. So I think you can. I think any kind of subdivision, I think knowing that activity helps you with any kind of analysis. But the numbers are extraordinary because so many different things are influencing the phenotype. So you're really going to need to get into the millions. Now, maybe we'll be there someday. Okay, so I'll take maybe you know, one to last question. So it's more, you know, it's uh, when I met you, know, you in Boston you know, a few years ago, that's when you joined Pfizer, you know, you mentioned that, you know, that it's sometimes shame that, uh, you know, industry has such robust data, but they are, you know, they never be able to share due to various reasons. And you said you wanted to transform this to continue basic research and share, you know, such information to the community to actively publish paper through, you know, postdocs or scientists. And have you been successful, Maury? Uh, I, yes, actually, we so the, so for example, the, the um, our small molecule Daniel Glipron data was all published in uh, Nature Medicine last year, a prominent place. The whole data is there. It's the more recent data is currently currently under review. Um, the, the genetics data is a little bit more complicated because really what I showed you is putting together a lot of different stories, and a big hunk of that story is is, is published. Yeah, I you know I I've always as we've talked about a lot, if you look at most drug companies, they're working on exactly the same thing. Um, so this idea of secret... Now, there are things which we don't publish, but um, most of the stuff, uh, when the data are available, we, we, we just get it out there. I, think it's, I, I still think it's important we've been able to do it. There, there are problems, and one of them is our, our journal editors. Do we have editors here? <laughs> when it takes two years worth of, of, um, you know, of additional experiments to get the paper published... A postdoc does it because it's important for their job. A company, it's very hard to justify taking up a full salary for that. So, but we still do it because we have postdocs. Okay, so okay, Maury, you know, congratulations for both you. Success, you know, fantastic success in academia and industry, and then I look forward to seeing your next step. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so with this, uh, so I just want to give some practical aspects. So one thing is that at 5.30, we have Tina, and then, so I'm going to give, of course, present to Maury. That's, you know, of course, this is very important. So 5.30 outside, there's a buffet dinner. And also we have announcement of the poster flies. So please stick around for another 30 minutes. And then I pass to Julie for the closing remarks.